on World News Tonight. Looming threats. Nuclear plants caught in the crossfire of Ukraine and Russia conflict in the verge of a meltdown. Officials raise against time to prevent calamity. A munition race. Russia attempts to bring more firepower to the ongoing conflict with the aid of North Korea's arsenal. Weather woes. Hundreds of thousands across the globe suffer the impact of unprecedented flooding. Meanwhile, wildfires leave a blazing trail of destruction in the United States. And runway ready. Fashionistas from around the world gather in New York to flaunt their best works. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we start off with the war in Ukraine. The United Nations is now sounding the alarm on the Ukraine-Russia conflict following a thorough inspection of the region's nuclear plants that have been caught in the crossfire, claiming that unless a no-fire zone is established, there could be major repercussions. With ongoing shelling near Europe's biggest nuclear power plant sparking widespread concern of a pending disaster, the UN nuclear watchdog on Tuesday called for the fighting to stop and for a security zone to be established at the plant, located in Russian-controlled territory along the front line of its war with Ukraine. We are playing with fire and something very, very catastrophic could take place. The Zaporizhia nuclear plant, seized by Russia shortly after its invasion of Ukraine, is controlled by Russian forces, but run by Ukrainian technicians. Russia and Ukraine each accuse the other of shelling. In Ukraine, Rafael Grossi, head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, spoke at the United Nations on Tuesday following a report by the IAEA that called the situation unsustainable. He and other IAEA inspectors braved shelling to cross the front line and reach the power station last week. The hits that this facility has uh, received and that I could personally see and uh, assess together with my experts is simply um, uh, unacceptable. Grossi said a security zone should be established immediately around the plant, something also urged by United Nations Chief Antonio Guterres. An agreement on a demilitarized perimeter should be secured. Specifically, that would include a commitment by Russian forces to withdraw all military personnel and equipment from that perimeter and the commitment by Ukrainian forces not to move into it. Inspectors said they had found Russian troops and equipment at the plant, including military vehicles parked in turbine halls. Moscow has denied accusations that it used the plant as a shield for its forces, but says it has troops guarding it. The U.S. on Tuesday charged that Russia is in the process of buying millions of artillery shells and rockets from Cold War ally North Korea, and said this showed Moscow is suffering severe supply shortages in its war in Ukraine. Now, according to the Pentagon, Russia is preparing for an arms deal with North Korea. Russia has requested for ammunition from the country to further aid their efforts in conquering Ukraine. While the transaction has not yet occurred, the movement is an alarming sign of escalating conflict. According to the Pentagon, Russia is desperately in need of a boost in ammunition supplies amid the prolonged war in Ukraine and has now sought out the assistance of North Korea. Russia has approached North Korea to request ammunition. Um, I'm not able to provide any more detail than that at this point in time, uh, but it does demonstrate and is indicative of the situation that Russia finds itself in, in terms of its logistics and sustainment capabilities as it relates to Ukraine. The Pentagon press secretary added that Russia's request for help from North Korea indicates challenge on the sustainment front. However, he refused to comment on what kind of ammunition Moscow is looking for. National Security Council Coordinator for Strategic Communications John Kirby says the potential purchase of North Korean ammunition shows Russian President Vladimir Putin's desperation. He added that Russia has also been purchasing drones from Iran, noting that Moscow is forced to purchase military goods from countries Washington has dubbed rogue states. Meanwhile, IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi expressed a great deal of concern over the Zaprosia nuclear power plant, stressing that the situation at the facility continues to be very worrying. 
He called for the need to create a safety zone around the power plant, as it's within the IAEA's mandate to protect the safety and security of the facility and the people there. The comments come as the UN nuclear watchdogs inspectors noted significant damage to the nuclear plant in their recent visit. The IAEA still has two inspectors at the site where they hope to establish a continuous presence that could help stave off the possibility of a dangerous nuclear accident. The newly appointed PM in the UK, Liz Truss, promised that Britain would see sunnier days ahead despite the current economic gloom as she made her first speech as Prime Minister after taking over from Boris Johnson. As she takes up residence in Downing Street, all eyes are now on the UK's new Prime Minister to, as she put it, deliver, with the cooperation of the British people, even if they didn't elect her. As strong as the storm may be, I know that the British people are stronger. Our country was built by people who get things done. We have huge reserves of talent, of energy and determination. I am confident that together we can ride out the storm. As UK households look ahead to a winter in which energy bills are set to soar by more than 50%, Truss said her first priorities are tackling those prices, boosting the economy, bringing in tax cuts and improving access to the NHS. But there was little detail on how she plans to do it and the clock is ticking. Uh, I think we we're all hoping for a, a bit more detail and a sense of uh, what Liz Truss, the Prime Minister, was really going to be like and maybe a bit more depth about her governing philosophy. A sentiment time, echoed by Scotland's happy, First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, who said she'd do her best to work together to tackle those urgent issues, despite their political differences. She must act now, uh, not in the next few weeks, but literally in the coming hours and days to freeze energy prices for people and for businesses to deliver more cash support to people who are already finding it impossible to pay their bills. The UK's economic woes are now the portfolio of Kwasi Kwarteng, Truss's newly appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer. He's joined by the PM's allies, Suella Braverman as Home Secretary, James Cleverley as Foreign Secretary and Ben Wallace as Minister of Defence. The death toll from the strongest earthquake to hit China's southwestern Shijuang province since 2017 rose to 65 as rescuers rushed to reach hundreds of stranded people, restore utilities and send emergency relief. A 6.8 magnitude earthquake, the most powerful to hit China in almost a decade. The quake was recorded just after midday on Monday near Kangding, a mountainous region of the country. 39 kilometers from the epicenter, the town of Lu Ding has been ravaged. Rescue teams are working around the clock, sifting through rubble, looking for survivors. This woman is one of the lucky ones, pulled from the debris. The affected area is not densely populated, but the human toll is already high. Many dead, with dozens more missing. A death toll that could rise given the magnitude of the earthquake felt 200 kilometers away in the city of Chengdu, where 21 million inhabitants are currently in lockdown due to an outbreak of COVID-19. Over a thousand soldiers and army officers have been mobilized to help with the situation. Chinese President Xi Jinping saying he hopes to limit the loss of life. Scenes that bring back painful memories of a powerful earthquake in Sichuan in 2008, 7.9 in magnitude, which left 87,000 people dead. Over in the U.S., following Trump's legal victory of being approved for a special master to oversee confiscated documents, the U.S. Department of Justice is mulling over the option of appeal, which might be imminent due to fresh evidence coming forward in the January 6th election scandal. President Biden also continued to defend his accusations against Trump and his supporters. Tonight, the Justice Department is still weighing whether to appeal a federal judge's ruling to grant an independent third party, what's called a special master, to conduct a review of documents seized from Mar-a-Lago last month. That ruling, a win for former President Trump after FBI agents seized more than 11,000 government documents from his home, including hundreds marked classified. 
The decision will not halt the DOJ's criminal investigation into potential mishandling of secret documents, but it will pause their ability to use those seized documents in their investigation, while that special master determines whether any of those materials the FBI took are privileged, making them off-limits to federal prosecutors. The former president is blasting the investigation as politically motivated. The Mar-a-Lago raid was a desperate effort to distract from Joe Biden's record of misery and failure. But tonight, Mr. Trump's 2016 opponent, Hillary Clinton, is blaming him for the events surrounding January 6th that shows several Trump-linked technology consultants looking for evidence that Mr. Trump's defeat was fraudulent, being given access to a Georgia elections office by a local Republican official. That same day, the voting system there was allegedly breached. The Republican official, Kathy Latham, is now under investigation by federal and state prosecutors as part of a fake elector's scheme. Latham's lawyer did not respond, but has previously denied Trump supporters were given access to election equipment. Meanwhile, President Biden is again defending his earlier attacks on Mr. Trump and his supporters, whose beliefs last week he compared to semi-fascism, insisting they are separate from the mainstream GOP. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, several areas of the United States are experiencing record temperatures. Some regions even experiencing moments of spontaneous combustion due to the heat. Wildfires continue to burn, leaving many casualties. It exploded out of control so quickly, authorities say at least two people were unable to escape the flames. Another burn victim narrowly made it out alive during evacuations. The Southern California blaze, destroying homes near the town of Hemet, fueled by conditions that acted like a blowtorch. The fire was in alignment with the canyon, with the wind and the topography, so everything lined up for a critical rate of spread. California wildfires killing four people in just days. Historic heat is still baking the West. Horrible. It's just so hot. The 46 million struggling through sweltering conditions that have lasted a week won't see relief for days. After shattering records, several cities will stay above or near triple digits through much of the week. The worst heat wave of its kind in 150 years. I, yeah, we're melting. As some cities record their hottest day today, the suffocating heat dome over the West has only intensified because of climate change. Fall temperatures increase seen nearly three degrees across the country since 1970, making today's record temperatures five times more likely. Tonight, the strain on California's fragile power grid could finally snap. With demand for power forecasted to outpace supply, the Golden State is again on the verge of plunging into the dark. Despite anticipating the chaos and preparing beforehand, Typhoon Hinamno has managed to claim multiple lives in South Korea with its increasing strength and heavy downpours causing flash floods. Six people have lost their lives in South Korea due to Super Typhoon Hinamno, while six others are still missing as of late Tuesday night. The safety countermeasures headquarters say three have been injured. Most of the casualties have been reported in the southeastern coastal city of Pohang, including people who have been swept away by torrential water. Pohang city officials also said that contact had been lost with seven people who had entered a flooded underground parking lot of an apartment complex. Following hours of rescue operations, two survivors walked out of the parking garage. I saw a person waving his hand, and he walked out as I directed my lantern towards him. He had this styrofoam around his body. They miraculously survived while holding on to the pipes on the ceiling of the parking lot for nearly 13 hours. Unfortunately, authorities say six others were found with cardiac arrest. They add that the total death toll could rise as rescue operations continue. Nearly 90,000 homes have experienced power outages across the country, while over 8,000 homes have reportedly been submerged. Nationwide, over 4,700 people had to evacuate their homes due to the typhoon.
Now, Pakistan continues to fall into deeper waters with authorities struggling to keep the Indus River from overflowing any further. Despite the relentless effort to keep the tides at bay, a majority of the country is severely affected by the floods till now. One third of Pakistan is engulfed by historical flooding. Hundreds of towns and villages in the province of Sindh still remain underwater. Every day, this rescue team goes to help the inhabitants who are trapped in their homes. The speedboat is driving over what was once the Indus Highway. This town has not been entirely evacuated. The lifeguard's boat fills up in a few minutes. Eighty kilometers away, in Pakistan's largest freshwater lake Manchhar, water has reached dangerous levels, threatening the neighboring densely populated areas. The floodgates of the lake are already overflowing. The authorities have called upon inhabitants of nearby villages to evacuate. Fear of the population is intensifying, as in some areas of Sindh, the water level continues to rise. Europe is ready to accelerate its jabbing campaigns. Pharmaceutical heads are debating on the most efficient way to speed up the vaccination programs in order to better prepare for any threats of the outbreak in the autumn and winter seasons. Speed is of the essence to protect citizens from any new COVID-19 outbreaks this autumn and winter, and the process needs to be accelerated. Several representatives of the pharmaceutical industry debated the launch of the second-generation vaccines at the European Parliament and gave some clear warnings. Today, the production capacity of COVID-19 vaccines far exceeds the number of doses that can be administered. The challenge is no longer the vaccine supply but the capacity to successfully deliver national vaccination campaigns, especially in adults and in the elderly. Sanofi is one of the companies launching vaccines adapted to the Omicron variant and waiting for approval. The European Medicines Agency gave the green light to the new BioNTech, Pfizer and Moderna versions on the 1st of September, the day after the European Commission asked the member states to define their national strategies. They need to combine the COVID-19 and flu vaccinations ensure sufficient logistical capacity and start new public awareness campaigns of vaccines. The European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control forecasts that following a quiet summer, several European countries could see increasing trends in terms of COVID cases and hospital admissions. Although the EU is the second largest vaccines producer, the chair of the Special Committee on COVID-19 is worried about low vaccination rates in some countries. The European Parliament is also concerned about the costs for joint procurement and the transparency in the contracts between the EU and pharmaceutical companies. Welcome back to World News tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. US President Joe Biden says that he would see Chinese counterpart if Xi Jinping also attends the upcoming G20 summit slated for November. Vladimir Putin met Myanmar's junta chief during the Eastern Economic Forum in Russia. Myanmar has started buying Russian oil products and it's ready to pay the deliveries in rubles. Canadian police searched into a fourth day for the remaining suspect in a stabbing spree in which 10 people were killed in around an indigenous community rattling a country unaccustomed to acts of mass violence. Taiwan's army staged live fire exercises as part of a two-day military drill with a prostrate tension simmering in the background. Flares lit up targets on a mountainside at a base in the Taiwan's far southern Pintang County while tanks and cannons fired at almost complete darkness. More than 700 children have been reported to have died in food and nutrient centers across Somalia between January and July this year, according to a UNICEF Somalia representative. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now, the familiarity of New York Fashion Week is slowly starting to return as veteran designers and newcomers share space on the official calendar. 
We are leaving you tonight with visuals of the show in full swing. Stay safe and have a good night.